Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our um, monthly webinar. Um, today, we are happy to have with us Deborah Barton. She's an MD, medical oncologist, and the chief medical officer of Charisma Therapeutics. She brings 20 years of oncology experience, both in academia and as a practicing physician investigator in clinical trials, and in the biotechnology technology and pharmaceutical industry supporting the development of new drugs for the treatment of cancer. Deborah, we are so happy to have you here today. Um, I'm going to invite the audience to put any questions in the Q&A or in the chat box, and we will get to those questions after Deborah's um, presentation. Um, yeah, so I'll turn it over to you, Deborah. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Melinda. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to be here and glad for the opportunity to be in front of you talking to you today uh, about car macrophages and the potential in HER2 overexpressing solid tumors. I am going to share my screens. I prepared a few slides to go over all this with you. And I hope my laser pointer is appearing. Can you see? Great. Okay, so this is what we are going to talk about today. And I have a little bit of science and a little bit of the clinical trial that is currently open for enrollment. And I'll have some information there. And hopefully I'll get your attention and some interesting questions towards the end of the session. Uh, how can I go? Yes. So starting with cancer overall, the estimate of the American Cancer Society for 2021 is uh, almost 2 million people to be newly diagnosed with cancer this year, which means about 5,200 people every day to hear those words, you have cancer. Uh, specifically to our group today, I put the figures of uh, liver, intrahepatic, gallbladder, and other biliary, but it's really a lot of uh, people. And I don't know why this is not... There you go. 2.7% of all of them are estimated to be HER2 positive. So you think 2.7% is not that much, but it's a lot of people. It's almost 2 million people. And also I will show you a little bit later, different tumor types have either more or less HER2 overexpression. So for some tumors, it is really common to be HER2 positive. Now a little bit of how cancer treatment evolved over the years. Historically, there has been three strategies to treat cancer. The big one, surgery, chemo, and radiation. It was very simple. It's highly effective. It's sometimes very toxic. And as we progressed and we learned more about cancer, the cancer cells and how to attack them, in the past two decades, a major change happened when we understood targeted therapies, such as kinase inhibitors and monoclonal antibodies, including Herceptin, which is a HER2 targeted agent. And in the past several years, we're talking about an upgrade. So the immunotherapy started to come up and is now a standard of care for many cancers. And it's really brilliant because it activates the patient's own immune system to fight more efficiently against cancer. It includes some monoclonal antibodies that you have heard before and adoptive cell therapies, which is the, the modality that we're gonna be discussing today. And in the adoptive cell therapies, there are CAR T cells, there are TILs, TCRs, and CAR macrophages, which is what we're talking about. 
And how all those new therapies come to light? So the clinical development of new products in oncology is very complex and it takes many years and many, many people, a lot of work. So it starts back in the lab with discovery where new products or new cell products are, de are developed and some of them uh, satisfy the prerequisites to be given to humans. That's a rare portion of them. When they are able to come to humans, we start phase one clinical trials. There are normally small sized studies, 10 to 50 patients, normally enrolls patients with advanced disease, may mix patient populations because the primary endpoint is safety. We really wanna make sure that that new drug is safe to give to patients. If it's considered safe, then we're going to the phase two. Phase two, we can have mixed size studies from 50 to 200 patients or even more. We specify a patient population there, a specific number of prior lines of therapy are required. Sometimes it's the sites of metastatic disease. So we really select a patient that we believe based on phase one data that will extract the most benefit for that therapy. And there the endpoint is efficacy. We really wanna know on phase two if the treatment works for that patient. And the phase three are very large studies, randomized. Randomized mean half of the patients receive a, a new therapy and half of the patients receive standard of care. And then those two are compared and see who goes better. And that's for regulatory submission intent. And then there are other phase four studies. But here we're talking about cell therapies and cell therapy is different. The clinical development plan is different. The phase one, phase two, phase three doesn't necessarily go that way. It's a more agile, it's a more complex. So it's really a different clinical development process that you will see happening. Now, going back to those 2.7% of patients who have tumors, which are HER2 overexpressing, there's this very nice study of almost 38,000 cases that stained with HER2 immunohistochemistry, the IHC. And when they are three plus, they're considered positive. So you see there's a list of tumors that have virtually no expression of HER2 whatsoever. And then you have a large number of tumors that do express HER2 to a certain degree, some more, some less. So you can see here the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is about, I don't know, I would say 0.7%. The extrahepatic much more frequently and gallbladder cancers as well. And that just means that a small percent of patients will have HER2 expression, but the HER2 expression is the same. So if you are that one patient that has it, it overexpresses just like the other tumor types. Now, going to adoptive cellular therapy, that's the beauty of it. Those are living drugs. So it's not a vial that you take in the pharmacy and you prepare and you inject. It's really a living drug. Cell therapy is the transfer of cells with a determined function to a patient. Those cells can either come from the same patient, which we call autologous, or it can come from a healthy donor, which we call allogeneic. There is gene therapy, that is the transfer of genetic material into certain cells of the body. And there is cell and gene therapy, when you do a transfer of gene genetic material 
to cells that you're going to transfer to a patient. So here with the CAR macrophages, we are talking about cell and gene therapy, the two together. And what's the CAR that everybody is talking about? The CAR is a chimeric antigen receptor. Chimeric meaning there are two functions in there, two in one. Antigen is like a protein on the cell and a receptor is what recognizes that protein. So when the genetic material is transferred to immune cells and that makes these cells express the car on their, on their surface. That's where the cell and gene comes from. And the car that is expressed in the immune cell is a receptor that is specific to a tumor antigen. In, in this case, HER2. So it's very specific and that, that uh, immune cell will recognize the tumor cell that has HER2. That has shown remarkable responses in refractory patients with some hematological malignancies, but not necessarily solid tumors. Hematological malignancies, they're very frequently expressed CD19, and the CD19 CAR T cells are very successful on that field. And why does that not necessarily work as well for solid tumors? Uh, the solid tumors are different than hematological malignancies in many ways. One way is that the solid tumors generally arise from various mutations and cell alterations. So you have the in, within a solid tumor, there are different cells in there. And within the different metastatic sites, there are different cells in there. They're not all the same. So hematological malignancies, they're mainly very well identified by one characteristic that is, for example, BCR able in chronic myeloid leukemia that is very well controlled with kinase inhibitors or CD19, which is a hallmark in some leukemias and lymphomas that is very well controlled by CAR-T those cells, they kind of all look the same. So they all have the target and the CAR T will find it. Solid tumors are different. Solid tumors, they have those different cells within the tumor. And as it progresses, it, uh, the original clones expand and new clones arise. So it keeps changing. So when you give a targeted therapy to those cells who have the target, the tumor mass will decrease. Most target cells will respond to that target therapy, but the other clones that don't have the target, they remain and eventually they grow. And that tumor escapes, regrows, and it's not anymore uh, sensitive to that target therapy because the target is not there. Plus, solid tumor is solid. It's really a block. It's hard for the CAR T's to get in. The, the solid tumors, they know that the CAR T's are there to destroy them. So they create this immunosuppressive microenvironment that basically tells the T cells to go away. Um, and, and one tumor cell in the solid tumor can express various different new antigens. So this is a very important point for our continuation of the conversation. Uh, there you go. Why do we think that macrophages will make it differently than the CAR T cells and will be able to make an impact in solid tumors. The macrophages are cereal eaters. They eat one after the other, like the Pac-Man. They remove foreign bodies, bacteria, and sometimes tumor cells. 
And I say sometimes because the tumor associated macrophages, they're sitting in there in the solid tumor. They are in a quiet mode. We call it M2. They don't want to work. They don't want to eat the tumor cells. So those stems, they're not necessarily the good guys. The good guys are the M1 macrophages. Those are the activated macrophages that they come into the tumor. They secrete cytokines that cause the, that tumor microenvironment to become more welcoming to other immune cells to come. And most importantly, after engulfing the tumor cells that have the target, so imagine a car macrophage will find a tumor cell that has the HER2. They will engulf that tumor cell and they will process everything that is in the tumor cell, even things that are not HER2 related. And they will present all that material to the T cells who in turn will mount an attack to all those different targets. So this is how the CAR macrophage works. It, it will identify the HER2 receptor on the tumor cell. The CAR macrophage is necessarily unlocked in an M1 profile. It will engulf the tumor cell. It will digest and process all that material. At the same time, in the tumor microenvironment, it will send signals via cytokines calling the other immune cells, T cells and, and dendritic cells and NK cells to come and help so they will say, T cell, this tumor that I just ate have, have all these different antigens. Go ahead and kill the other tumor cells. So those T cells, they can kill the tumor cells that don't have HER2. The macrophages will take care of the cells that have the HER2 and the T cells will take care of the other cells. And we have some experiments that actually prove that to happen in the lab. So the first experiment, we had a group of mice with a HER2 positive tumor implanted in their flank. And when they received CAR macrophages, the tumors shrink and the mice survived for a longer period of time as compared to the untransduced, which is a macrophage without the car. It works a little, but not that well. And the control was not treated. So it did prolong survival in mice. This other experiment is a little bit closer to reality. So we had a, a few mice implanted with HER2 positive and HER2 negative tumors in the different flanks. That is a little bit more realistic for us who have heterogeneous tumors. So having a positive and a negative treated with the CAR macrophage intratumoral injection and those HER2 positive tumors decreased size. And interestingly, the HER2 negative tumors had a delayed progression. And that's a limited period of time, just a few days for this experiment. But it does say that what we were discussing before on the macrophages presenting the tumor as a whole to the T cells, so the T cells can go and attack all cells, not only the HER2 positive. It does uh, translate into mouse models reflecting those results. It also shows that the CAR macrophages recruit to the tumor microenvironment 
different cells to help them act. So you have more CD3, CD8, CD4, natural killer cells, and the dendritic cells. So the car macrophages is calling everybody else to help. And just one more experiment, then I'm going to jump into the clinical trial. This experiment shows that the CAR macrophage therapy vaccinates mice against tumor recurrence and prevents antigen negative, meaning HER2 negative relapse. So those mice received a HER2 positive tumor. Then when they were treated with the CAR macrophage, those tumors disappeared. And then later on, they received a HER2 negative tumor. And that tumor did not grow, which makes sense because the CAR macrophage interaction with the T cells and the other immune cells, it creates a long lasting adaptive immune response that serves as a vaccine to all those different tumor antigens that were presented. Uh, so this is one quick note on how the rest of the body, we know how the tumors react, they shrink, the mice live longer. Now, how the normal cells behave? Do car macrophages eat normal body cells? And the answer is no. So we did an experiment comparing normal tissue herd to expression. So here you have the control of a tumor cell that is herd to positive, and here are all the other normal body cells. So you have lung cells, you have cardiac, you have col colonic cells and all these other cells. They are not HER2 positive. They have a dim expression at some level or ne negligible. And then when we, gi when we gave CAR macrophages to those cells, they didn't eat. They just ate the tumor cells because the HER2 expression is so high, but the cells, the normal cells who are HER2 low or dim, they don't, uh, the macrophages don't eat them. Charisma is currently the leader in engineer myeloid cells. Macrophages are myeloid cells. You have some companies developing T cells and K cells, but in the myeloid cell group, macrophages and monocytes, we are the only ones that are currently in clinic testing it in humans. The way we're doing it is that the patient will be mobilized with GCSF injections, Neupogen, for four days subcutaneously. Then the patient will sit by an apheresis machine. That apheresis bag will be shipped fresh to California and will be processed in a GMP facility over there where the monocytes collected from the blood will become macrophages, will receive the genetic material to make them uh, express the car. They will be cryopreserved and shipped back for infusion. That manufacturing is a seven day manufacturing time, but we need to add a little more time for the sterility and mycoplasma testing that we need to do. And uh, that's how we are proceeding with the clinical trial. The apheresis, if you are not familiar with it, after four days of GCSF subcutaneous mobilization, uh, that mobilization will make the bone marrow produce loads of white blood cells, way more than what you need. 
So this machine will filter the blood and remove only the excess white blood cells. It's a three to four hour procedure. It's outpatient. It selects the white blood cells and it returns the red blood cells and the platelets. And enough white blood cells remain in the body to continue defending against infections and everything else that they need to do. So now talking specifically about the phase one clinical trial that is open for enrollment in two sites, the University of Pennsylvania and the University of North Carolina. So this is a multi-center phase one clinical study with a primary endpoint of safety and manufacturing feasibility. Uh, we're going to look at the HER2 CAR macrophages in patients with recurrent or metastatic solid tumors. When we talk about HER2, everybody immediately thinks about breast cancer, but it's very important to remind people that a variety of tumor types can express HER2, like we discussed in the beginning of this talk. And we're going to be enrolling all of them in this study as long as they're eligible. So we're, we will need 18 patients for this study. The, the patients will receive GCSF during manufacturing if needed, if clinically required, bridging therapy can be given. And we're going to do scans before treatment. At the time of treatment, we have the first group of patients receiving the therapy split in day one, day three, day five. And if all goes well here, the second group of nine patients will receive all therapy on day one. We're going to have a tumor biopsy before infusion and two post infusion because we want to make sure we look at the tumor and everything that is happening, the macrophages getting there, them recruiting the T cells and all the other cells and doing what they're supposed to do, eating the cells, secreting cytokines and so on. So we're looking at all that. This is a first in human. So we want to make sure that we look at everything that we have to, to document in terms of how this cell therapy works. Of course, we are interested in overall response, survival, progression-free survival, and we have a number of things that we're looking in the blood and in the biopsies. So for the patient, how does it work in the study? So there's a pre-screening and screening uh, interval that is up to three weeks. Uh, the patients can be either referred from other clinics or they can come up and seek for it. They will sign the informed consent form and perform scans, have a clinical evaluation, make sure everything is right review the HER2 expression of the tumor, and then they will be enrolled and be assigned a manufacturing slot. A pretreatment biopsy may be required if the patient received a HER2 targeted agent. We need to make sure that we still have HER2 positive cells there to react uh, to the CAR macrophage. So for the, pr the production of the cells, and we call them CTO 508, a home healthcare vendor will go to the patient's house or the patient will go to the clinic to receive mobilization with GCSF for four days. Then the patient will come to the hospital to do the aphoresis. It's gonna be shipped to California. And then whenever it's ready, it's gonna be shipped back to the site. The first three patients of the study will be hospitalized for eight days just to make sure everything goes well. The group one will have nine patients, group 
to have another nine patients. The post-treatment biopsies are day seven and four weeks. And we will be collecting scans to measure the tumor sequentially over time and see how it decreases, hopefully. We'll be following the patients also for survival and if they required subsequent anti-cancer therapies after the study. The objectives we already discussed a little bit, but first and foremost, the safety and tolerability and also feasibility of manufacturing. I can tell you that the first patient has been treated. We were able to go through with the whole mobilization, aphoresis, manufacturing. The patient received the cells and everything went as planned. So this is very exciting. The main inclusion criteria for this study is recurrent or metastatic solid tumors for which there are no available curative treatment options. And for patients who already use the HER2 targeted agents when available. And available is only for breast and gastroesophageal cancers only. Those are the two ones that have HER2 targeted agents approved for their treatment. Patients must be at least 18 years of age. The tumor must be HER2 positive according to uh, well-known ASCOCAP guidelines. So either immunohistochemistry 3 plus or FISH positive. And the patient must be willing and able to undergo tumor tissue biopsies. We already discussed about this. I'm not going to repeat. And we have produced some materials. We are aware that is a complex study. There's mobilization of pheresis. There's the treatment. Some patients will receive the treatment split in three days over a period of five days. Some patients will receive everything on day one. So we put a number of uh, materials that are aiming to facilitate the understanding and the participation in the study. And this is my last slide. We can only do this together. So we have so many people behind the scenes working to make this study a reality. There is the team at Charisma, which I'm included. There is the team at the CRO. There's a very big team at the clinical sites of physicians and nurses and coordinators and absolutely the most important people in the study are the patients and the caregivers that are trusting their care to this potential uh, new therapy and are investing such an important um, moment of their life to join a study like this to further scientific knowledge. So I can only thank everybody uh, and thank you for your attention. And I think we can open for questions. Okay, wonderful. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna invite the audience just to send in any questions through the Q&A or the chat box so we can ask um, Dr. Barton about them. I wrote down a few questions as I was going through. Um, can you elaborate on any side effects that might be expected? Yes. Um, so as other CAR T cells, it's well known that they produce cytokine release syndrome and sometimes some neurological adverse events. We do not expect to see that with CAR macrophages for two reasons. One is that the CAR macrophages, they're injected in the vein, so they get into the circulation and they don't like to stay there. So they get out and go into tissues very quickly. So their production of cytokines is in the tissue, is not in the blood. 
this is one of the reasons. The CAR T cells, they get in the blood and they stay there and they multiply and they produce cytokines. That's why you have that adverse event. The CAR macrophages do not multiply. Whatever the patient receives, that's it. So you don't have that expansion of number of cells in the bloodstream producing cytokines to cause cytokine release or neurotoxicity. So we do not expect to see that. The preclinical animal models did not show toxicities. So we're going to learn more uh, with the clinical trial now. Wonderful, thank you. Um, a question from Sarah, how do you lock them into M1? That's a very good question. Thank you for asking, Sarah. Uh, what we have observed was that the transduction using the viral vector to make the macrophage produce the car makes the macrophage M1 profile and it doesn't get out of the M1 profile. So we can shower that macrophage with immunosuppressive cytokines and it will remain M1. That's an observation that we saw and we're happy about it. And we really believe it's due to the viral vector that although it's not really an infective virus, it does create intracellular processes that make the macrophage remain M1, regardless of what happens around it. Um, okay, so this is very exciting for the trial. Is there an ECOG performance requirement? I believe there is, and I believe it is zero and one. Okay, so that's pretty typical for most trials. And all right, I had another. Um, so in regards to, you said it took about three weeks for the pre-screening process. Do you want patients to be off treatment during that pre-screening process or would they still be able to continue on treatment that they were on before or prior? And then a little bit about the bridging therapy you talked about. Yeah, so that depends. The, the three weeks is the maximum. So if a patient comes to a site, a clinical site, and they're able to schedule all scans and echocardiogram and do the clinical exam all in a day or two, that's the screening time. I just need to have all those tests done, right? So it doesn't necessarily need to be three weeks. In terms of treatment, the patient can receive treatment, but we need some washout period prior to the aphoresis because the patient needs to be in very good state to have the mobilization happening and to sit at the aphoresis comfortably and be fine with it. Then after aphoresis happen and the aphoresis bag is shipped to California and production is ongoing, there is about a little over three weeks that the patient needs to wait. If there is clinical requirement to receive therapy in that interval, they can. So the, that's the bridging therapy during manufacturing time. And that only cannot be a HER2 targeted agent. And that cannot be another cell therapy but there are various other options that the investigator or physician can provide to the patient in that interval if it's required. Okay, great. Um, is there a location consideration for the trial? You said there are two sites open. Do you plan to open to more? We are thinking about it. Uh, and you can always go to clinicaltrials.gov and if you search in the search box for CT-0508, you're going to find our study and the sites will be listed there. So, so far, only two sites. And it's also listed on our website, but the two sites were uh, University of Pittsburgh. No, University of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, sorry. In Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And and University then... of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Okay, wonderful. Um, if a patient's 
IP manufacturing process fails, can they undergo another aphoris aphoresis procedure and attempt to join the trial a second time or more? Very good question as well. And yes, so the at when a second time happens, all the inclusion exclusion criteria still apply. So we just need to make sure that the patient remains in shape to go through the procedure one more time. Uh, there is no reason why it would be a problem. So they can mobilize two times and then they can freeze two times. Okay. Melinda? Yeah. Sorry, um, I think one of the unanswered questions got in the answered box here. Um, has there been any research using this approach with macrophages in other biomarkers or is it only showing promise in HER2 positive tumors? That is absolutely room for others as well. Thank you for the question. Uh, we at Charisma have the HER2 being the most advanced. So we had the whole preclinical package done, ready to enter clinic. We have to liaise with the FDA, get all the approvals, and now we're enrolling patients. We have two other targets being looked at. One is called PSMA for prostate cancer, and the other one is called mesothelin for a number of other cancers. And those are still in the preclinical stage. We are not in clinical trials yet, but we are planning for those to come to clinic later on. Great. Um, I can't remember what my notes mean. Are there any other questions? I think we answered all of them that were in the Q and A. Uh, and while you're looking at your notes, I can tell everybody if you can see behind me, this colorful thing here that I'm pointing at is a big blob with little circles inside. That's a big macrophage full of tumor cells that it engulfed and ate. So this is actually our record breaker. We counted 18 tumor cells for this one guy. So uh, this is just, I think it's exciting and very pretty picture from our lab. That is a great picture. Um, I'm excited to see uh, how you've got one patient enrolled. Can you tell us the type of cancer or not? I, I would rather not for confidentiality okay. no problem. but we are open to enroll all different patients and hopefully we'll have a cholangiocarcinoma patient joining the study as well. I imagine that you will. Um, I hope so too, and hopefully soon. Uh, Isabel, do you have any questions or anyone in the audience? Last call for questions. I think you covered most of mine throughout your presentation as I was writing them down. Oh, sorry, I did have one other question. Where can patients get those flyers and information booklets that you showed a picture of? That's a very good question. Uh, currently only at the two sites, but I'm gonna work on seeing if we can make them available electronically. And if we can do, that's a homework for me to do after today. And if I can make them available electronically, I will be sure to send them to the Colangio Carcinoma Foundation. Wonderful, thank Wonderful. you. Yeah, that would be great. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions. That was a great presentation. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, this is recorded and we'll host it on the website and on our YouTube channel. So feel free to share with um, other people and other patients. And if you have any questions after the fact that you think of, please send them to me and I will um, pass them on to Dr. Barton. And thank I you so much. Answer them. Wonderful. Thank you so much for presenting today. We appreciate it. And thank you for the trial. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.